this, this reminds me, and, and there are a few people in this room who are old enough to remember this, of the, the great teach-ins that went on uh, in uh, the 1960s and 70s uh, in Europe and the United States about some of the great issues that were sweeping the world at that time, having to do with uh, civil rights and democracy. And uh, uh, this, was, this was when universities would get together and there would be an open and free discussion of some of these issues. And I'm delighted that in some respects we can recreate that atmosphere here at CEU around uh, topics that are obviously of a great and immediate uh, importance. We are on the verge, I think, of another great transition. Um, I think in many ways, using the experience of this region, the questions, at least initially, that we might ex ask ourselves, is this a transition similar to uh, 1989 in Berlin? Or is it a transition similar to the tragedies that occurred in Prague in 1968 and in Budapest and Hungary in 1956? Uh, is it possible that something entirely new could emerge which uh, redefines the meaning of open society and the meaning of democracy in the context of, of the events that are unfolding? And what are the stakes? The stakes are very high, clearly. They're extremely high for Egyptians and Tunisians. They're high for millions of others uh, throughout the Middle East. They're very high for governments in Europe and the United States, which have long backed stability in the Middle East at the expense of democracy and human rights. So the stakes are very, very high. I would like to emphasize that uh, what is going on, I mean, I would call it a more popular revolt uh, today in Egypt, actually has its roots in the uh, public sector workers' uh, revolts and the other social movements that have already erupted in 2007 and 2008. And these were uh, reactions against the uh, economic liberalization uh, in the country, uh, the economic liberalization program that was initiated uh, by the uh, Mubarak's uh, government in 2004. So it has its roots. I mean, none of these things just evolved right now, you know, in Egypt. It has a kind of a history. These are exciting times. And I say that not just as an anthropologist working in the Middle East, but also as an Israeli. Today, I would like to argue very carefully that what we're witnessing today is a certain return of a new form of pan-Arabism. The Egyptian uprising is a moment of victory for democracy, which I believe could make possible a new form of politics, a politics of recognition, a politics of exposure of truth. Anyone who is slightly familiar with the Egyptian society knows that it is not a revolutionary society. One Egyptian observer likened Egypt to a sleepy elephant, which is now awakened and cannot be stopped. One of the central components of Mubarak's legitimacy in Egypt these last 30 years was very much this fear of democracy, uh, in the sense of fear of this idea that if there's not me, there's one alternative, and this is, of course, the brotherhood. Uh, and since no one wants the brothers, obviously I can do what I want, and we maintain this sort of position in which we have this nice little balance where I stay in power, but no one really questions it too much. Uh, this has very much changed in this generation, uh, and the question has become, what is it that is happening presently, um, which sees this younger generation believing, in fact, in the possibilities of democracy. I was in American University in Cairo, maybe 2005 or something, uh, and uh, an economics department, when you speak with the people, of course, once... Uh, you know, you felt the political situation because one people began to speak about, I mean, classical economic stuff, but the, uh, some kind of economic policy issues, they would little bit decrease the voice. And so that's what we did in 1985 in Prague or something, yeah? yeah? We were kind of modern, liberal, but something might happen, so we decreased the voice. So I, 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 I felt, that, felt that clearly. So for the beginning, maybe it's enough. Thank you. The, the specter that's hovering over say some of the discussions of the revolution in Egypt, especially in Israel and America, I think, is the specter of Iran in 1979. And I'm wondering if, in particular, people that uh, work on Islamic mobilization um, could talk a little bit about the distinction between um, Shia Iran and Sunni Egypt and how this may have bearing on the unraveling or unfolding of events 
in the, in the coming weeks, coming months, coming years. For me, I see a major difference between what happened in Iran and what's happening in Egypt and Tunisia and maybe in other parts of the Arab world that you know, we can see. Uh, the political Islam was the main motor in the Iranian revolution. Uh, this is not the case in Egypt and this is not the case in, uh, in, in Tunisia today. So we are seeing a different kind of for mass revolt, as I said, for people are rallying for democratic and economic rights, but the political Islam, and I, I very much agree that there is no political leadership uh, to this. I mean, there is no yet political leadership, which was not the case in, in the Iranian revolution. Uh, about, in, regarding the difference between Sunni and Shiite Islam, uh, Michael raised a very important point. And I really don't know if everyone is very clear on this. I mean, not only people in this room, but generally speaking. First of all, uh, Shiite Islam has a very ancient tradition of oppositional politics. Um, it goes right back to the, the 17th century, 16th century, when the mullahs could get people on the street like that. Another point is this, um, this I'm hearing more and more of this political Islam. Uh, does this mean simply the Islam we do not like? Because it's beginning to sound like that. You know, um, the, the Islam we like are these nice guys who wear coats and ties and, you know, uh, whatever. And the Islam we don't like are these guys who wear these funny tablecloths on their heads, you know. Uh, and, and they're political. Well, I hate to say this, but Islam was, Islam was always political, right? Right way back whenever. Um, it was never a non it's, it began as a, as, a, as a political movement. There is a great deal of misunderstanding both in Europe and in the United States about the forces that are at work. And I think, again, I'd refer back as a, as a moment, a watershed moment, to 9-11. Uh, I think 9-11 uh, set uh, average American and European opinion into a very negative mode with respect to Islam. Uh, not just political Islam, but all of Islam in a, in a certain way. Well, my name is Rania, and I'm from Egypt, and I just came back from Cairo yesterday night. And I just wanted to say some comments. <clears throat> uh, the first comment, everyone is referring to Tahrir Square, like as if like, everything is just happening there. Although that demonstration is taking place all over Egypt. In every city of Egypt, there is demonstration. BBC uh, reported that there were more than 8 million people last Tuesday, and I think it's underestimated, it's even more than this. And I think it's meant to be, it's the, the, like the media, um, the media is focusing only on Tahrir Square and in Cairo, so if they dismantle this crowd, they mean they aborted the revolution. And I, I don't know, I hope, uh, it, it actually it's working, because lots of people now outside Cairo, they come to Cairo to, to demonstrate because no one is paying any attention to them. There is no media coverage. We don't know anything happening there. Although there is so many demonstrations all over Egypt. This is something yeah, I, 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 hope, I hope it changes. Let me thank everybody in the panel and the audience for a very lovely discussion.